Billions of Bricks by Kurt Cyrus. Two, four, six. Look at all the bricks. Red and rough, hard and tough. Two, four, six. Ten, twenty, thirty. Some are old and dirty. Some are clean or in between. Ten, twenty, thirty. Dig the clay, squish it thick. Take a mold and make a brick. Dump it out, let it dry. Stoke the oven way up high. Mix, mix, mix the mortar for the bricks. Make it sloppy, goopy, gloppy. Mix, mix, mix. Bricks and blocks abound. Build beneath the ground. Arches, pillars, walls, and cellars, winding all around. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Stacks of bricks, bricks a plenty. Lay them at your feet. Fit them nice and neat. Four by four. Then more and more, repeat, repeat, repeat. On it goes, in rows and rows, and soon you have a street. Two, four, six, another batch of bricks, big and small. We use them all. Two, four, six. Build a solid base. Lock them into place. Ten, twenty, thirty, forty, filling every space. Clack, clack, clack. Bricks can break your back. Bend your knees when lifting, please. Clack, clack, clack. Stack them to the sky, a hundred meters high. Twenty, forty, sixty, eighty, straight into the sky. Two, four, six, a million billion bricks, columns, walls, shopping malls, halls of politics, grand hotels, wishing wells, railroad yards, boulevards, fountains, pools, public schools. This whole book is full of bricks, and now that it's been written. We couldn't stack another block for all the bricks in Britain. The work is nearly done. The cleanup has begun. Let's count the bricks we didn't use all together. One. Bulldozer helps out by Candice Fleming and Eric Roman. The construction site bustled. Cement mixer was stirring, stirring, stirring. Crane truck was lifting, lifting, lifting. Digger truck was scooping, scooping, scooping. And bulldozer was watching, watching, watching. He said with a sigh. Puffing some smoke from his stack, he bumped to where the other trucks worked. "I can help!" he exclaimed. He raised his blade hopefully. "You're too little," rumbled dump truck. "You'll get hurt." Building skyscrapers is a rough, tough job," clattered cement mixer. "For rough, tough trucks," rattled digger. Bulldozer turned away. The big trucks looked at one another. But maybe, clanged Crane. See over there, Crane pointed. That needs to be cleared and flattened. I can do it! I can do it! Cried Bulldozer. So what are you waiting for, kid? Grumbled Roller Truck. Hooray! Squealed Bulldozer. 
honking his horn. He zoomed, bump room to his worksite. Once there, he revved his motor. He lowered his blade. Charge! Erk! He sat, smoke puffing from his stack, for a moment. Then he gave the pile a little nudge. Then a second, then a third. And when he'd gotten it just right, he hunkered down, hushed and watchful. His motor hummed, soft as a lullaby. Hours passed. At last, the other trucks bumped to where Bulldozer was working. He hadn't done a single thing they'd asked. I thought he was big enough, boomed Digger. I thought he was rough enough, rattled Scraper. I thought he was tough enough, clattered Grater. Move out of the way, kid, roared Roller. I'll fix that in no time flat. But Bulldozer wouldn't budge. Instead, he whispered, Shh! How rude, belched Cement Mixer. Shh! Behave yourself, rattled Scraper. Shh! You mind Roller Truck this minute, clanged Crane. Shh! Then, above the banging, rattling, rumbling, floated a tiny sweet sound. The trucks quieted, and in the silence, a chorus of gentle mews rose into the air. Is that what I think it is? boomed Digger. Bulldozer raised his blade. He moved aside. <coughs> They're pretty cute, kid, said Dump Truck. But taking care of babies? Now that's a rough, tough job. I can do it! I can do it! cried Bulldozer. The big trucks looked at one another again. We believe you can, claimed Crane. And he did. Dreaming Up by Christy Hale Cup on cup, stacking up, smaller, smaller, and growing taller. Earth and water, sun and air, all around, everywhere. Cold and wet, hot and dry, mixed together, makes mud pie. Open the top and in I hop, poke out a square, to see who's there. Pull in the flap to hide from view. Can you see me? I see you. Blankets flung, stretched chair to chair. Soft roof arcs low. A cozy place, a hideaway, where you and I can go. Touch wood. Fingers learn each form. Hang shapes on air, explore new directions. Every block anchored with care. Fluid with water, towers twist high. Sparkle with sea glass, treasures and shells. Sand castle. One by one, block by block, plastic shapes interlock. Yellow. Red, white, and black all connect in a stack. Build a world brick by brick. Hold them close, hear the click. Paper thin cards slice through space. Lean, brace, hold still this moment of balance. Easy peasy as can be, toothpicks joining, one, two, three. Sticks touch like fingertips, reach high where wishes roam. Cupped between is magic space, 
in a forest fairy home. Balls of snow, bags of land, bend down low, fill your hand. Pack them, stack them, circle round. Dome is home, is built on ground. Paper tubes, stuff reused, anything does the trick. Tape or glue for strength, and you have raised a building quick. Flat wooden sticks stuck with glue, gaps in between where sun peeks through. Solid then open, dark then bright, shifting patterns, flickering light, slates and slits. Standing side by side, add together, build round and wide, an open floor inviting space, welcome door to popsicle place. Add together, build round and wide, slates and slits standing side by side, shifting patterns, flickering light, solid then open, dark then bright, gaps in between where sun peeks through. Flat wooden sticks stuck with glue. Ever changing, soft forms tumble making. Caverns, secret spaces, pillow forts. Dream something big. The story of the Watts Towers. By Diana Hutz Aston. One chip of tile. Uncle Sam held it in his hand, studying it. His imagination turning like a kaleidoscope. He put it in his pocket. I'm gonna do something big. I heard him say. I didn't know it then, but that single chip of tile was no longer trash. It was the first building block. To a candy-covered castle. Uncle Sam was my neighbor. His name was Simon, but we never called him that. We lived in Watts, California, on 107th Street, where the aroma of tamales sizzled in the air, where the trucks of Japanese farmers rumbled to and from vegetable markets, where music and laughter rippled from diners and dancers at the Watts Tavern. No one really knew what to think about Uncle Sam, this man who talked to himself as he hunted through garbage heaps for things no one wanted. A rainbow of broken teapots, plates, tiles, and sparkling bottles. I collected jewels with him along the railroad tracks, sacks and sacks and sacks of them. My favorites were the tiles with blue flowers. The soda bottles with the girl and the bubbles, and the green horse. For every bag of bits, he gave me a penny. Pennies bought a lot of candy. Uncle Sam worked in a tile factory every day except Sundays and holidays. But he worked on his creation every night, every Sunday, every holiday. He took those bags of glass and smashed them. I watched him shove steel rods under the railroad tracks and transform them into rings. Uncle Sam was small and skinny, but his muscles were mighty. Some people called him crazy, but he wasn't. He was a magician. In broken things, he saw what no one else noticed. He found hearts in the backs of old ice cream parlor chairs, flowers in faucet handles, the sun in rusty gears. People who couldn't see the hearts and flowers wondered, "Why build it? Why build it? I can tell you," he said. "Why a man make the pants? Why a man make the shoes?" Uncle Sam talked to himself while he mixed a secret recipe for mortar. This much sand, this much cement, this much water, cement as powdery as flour, sand as finely ground as sugar, water to bind them. 
He wrapped wire mesh around the poles, smoothed the cement around them, and carefully pressed a jigsaw of jewels into his batter of wet cement. Day after day, year after year, working on his something big, without gloves until his fingerprints were worn away. A ship appeared, a tower rose, a cactus garden bloomed. In his strange mix of Italian and English that was difficult for all of us to understand, he told us about the great towers and the ship he'd seen as a child in the parades of his village of Ribatoli. Towers that were six stories high. Uncle Sam worked long into the night, singing to himself, flitting from rung to rung like a firefly. Turn out the light, Uncle Sam! I'm a-working up here, Marguerite! Every day the trains passed by, with tens of thousands of passengers a week, going to and from Los Angeles. The towers were Uncle Sam's stage, the passengers his audience. Dust from the trains swirled around him, but he didn't let it bother him. He was in the spotlight. Another tower arose. Uncle Sam showed my children the triangles in the branches of trees. Triangles, he said, were the strongest shapes and he built his tower with triangles day after day, year after year. He showed me and my children the beauty of a broken angel, a bowling ball, a boot, the usefulness of an airplane wing, the patterns shells and rocks could make. Uncle Sam was like a spider weaving his web of steel and cement and lacy shadows. The third tower was his last. He wrote his initials and Nuestro Pueblo in cement. Our town, a village for the world. Not long after that, Uncle Sam suddenly put away his tools and jewels and stopped building. We were all surprised. He put on a suit, pinned his life savings inside it, and gave the deed to his triangular lot with its ship and towers, fountains and gardens, to a friend and walked away. We never saw Uncle Sam again. But I remember him, my Uncle Sam, my neighbor for 34 years, the dreamer. People no longer call Simon Rodia foolish and crazy. They call him a man of genius who built a gigantic flower of folk art. A man with a heart full of gratitude to the country that had invited him to dream without limits. The country that had given him the freedom to reach for the sky. Uncle Sam's Something Big is now a national landmark. Harvey the Carpenter by Lars Clinton. Harvey is planning to make a toolbox today. All the tools Harvey needs are in his workshop, but it isn't very tidy. Sometimes it's hard for him to find things. Where on earth did he put his plan? Phew, here it is. Now he can get started. First, Harvey studies his drawing carefully. He doesn't want to make any mistakes. Then Harvey gets his tools ready. He takes out a tri-square and a folding ruler. Harvey measures the boards carefully and marks where he's going to cut the wood. The tri-square helps him draw straight lines. Now it's time to use the saw. 
Be careful, Harvey. A saw is very sharp. Harvey saws the board along the lines he drew. He needs a different tool for cutting curved pieces. This is a coping saw. That looks perfect. What a nice, neat job Harvey has done. Now Harvey wants to make some holes. He needs a brace and a bit that's just big enough. Boring holes is hard work. Harvey stands on his stool so he can reach. To make some little holes, Harvey needs different tools. He uses an egg beater drill and a bit that's just small enough. Harvey whizzes the egg beater drill round and round. The wood is rough and Harvey doesn't want to get a splinter. He needs to smooth down the wood with a rasp file, some sandpaper, and a sanding block. Harvey rubs the wood for a long time with the sandpaper. When he's finished, it feels lovely and smooth. All the parts are ready, so Harvey needs to fit them together. He uses a screwdriver and some screws. Harvey twists the screws into the little holes he made. They fit perfectly. For the next job, Harvey needs a hammer and some nails. Whoops! Harvey bends one of the nails. A pair of pliers will sort it out. Yank! Harvey tugs out the bent nail. It puts up quite a fight. The toolbox is almost done. All Harvey needs now is a mallet and some glue. Harvey fits the toolbox's handle into the big holes he bored. A bit of glue will keep it in place. Now Harvey collects up all his tools. His saw, file, nails, coping saw, sandpaper and block, screws, pliers, hammer, screwdriver, folding rule, tri-square, brace, bits, glue, mallet, egg beater drill. And puts them away in his brand new toolbox. Harvey has worked hard. Now it's time for a cup of tea. If I Built a House by Chris Van Dusen Jack, in the backyard, said to his mother, This house is okay, but it's like any other. It's boxy and boring and basically bland. It's nothing at all like the house I have planned. My house will be different. It can't be the norm. I think about traffic flow, function, and form. Oh, it may include shapes like a tower or dome, but I'll focus on what makes a building a home. It's the rooms on the inside that make it unique. So step through the door and let's take a peek. We'll start with the basics right off the bat. Check out my all-in-one kitchen o -mat. You don't have to cook and you don't have to clean. It's done by a space-age robotic machine. It makes all the meals and the food is delish. Then it washes and puts away every last dish. The living room's next. It's fun, come on in. The chairs and the table and sofa all spin. And trampolines lead to a giant ball pit. It's a pretty neat room, you have to admit. Now, look in the bathroom. No shower, no tub. Instead, 
Take a ride on my scrub a dub dub. Just step on the belt and it washes you clean, even the places that you've never seen. And here is my bedroom, way up in the sky, on top of a tower 200 feet high. With glass all around, just check out the view. A bed in a tower? Now that's something new. The rooms we walked through just moments before are the kinds that you'll find in any decor. But if I built a house, I'd add a few more. So hop on the slide, it's time to explore. You know how I constantly like to create? Well, this is my art room. Isn't it great? You draw on the wall. Don't worry, it's cool. Hung way up high on a big giant spool is a huge roll of paper that hangs to the floor. Just draw till you're done, then pull down some more. Next comes my flying room. See how it's tall? It's empty except for a switch on the wall. Just turn off the switch and you'll float off the ground. Then flap like a bird and fly all around. Isn't it nice to be up in the air? A room without gravity. That's pretty rare. This is my racetrack room. Step right inside. It's less like a room and more like a ride. It features a racetrack that loops all around with super fast go-karts that don't make a sound. You fly and you flip and you zip and you zoom. You have to admit, it's a wonderful room. A room filled with water? Now that's something new. But if I built a house, that's just what I'd do. This is my fish tank room. Ain't it a sight? Don't worry, they're friendly. The critters won't bite. Just strap on an air mask to swim with the fishes. Now this is a room that every kid wishes. Of course, I've been saving the best room for last. And literally speaking, this room is a blast. So welcome, sit down. I'll seal up the hatches. This plexiglass room completely detaches. You fly it around. Why, it even has jets. For me, this room is as good as it gets. My house will be nifty. My house will be neat. My house will stand out as the best on the street. Daringly bold, yet exquisitely fine. A must-see example of modern design. My house will be hailed as refreshingly new. If I built a house, that's just what I'd do. Iggy Peck, Architect by Andrea Beatty Young Iggy Peck is an architect and has been since he was two. When he built a great tower in only an hour with nothing but diapers and glue. Good gracious, Ignatius! His mother exclaimed. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. But her smile faded fast as a light wind blew past, and she realized those diapers weren't clean. Ignatius, my son, what on earth have you done? That's disgusting and nasty. It stinks. But Iggy was gone. He was out on the lawn using dirt clods to build a great sphinx. When Iggy was three, his parents could see his unusual passion would stay. He built churches and chapels from peaches and apples and temples from modeling clay. At dinner one night, to his father's delight, Iggy got a bright gleam in his eye and out on the porch built a St. Louis arch from pancakes and coconut pie. 
Dear Ig had it made until second grade, when his teacher was Miss Leela Greer. On the very first day, she had this to say: "We do not talk of buildings in here. Gothic or Romanesque, I couldn't care less about buildings, ancient or new." She said in her lecture about architecture. That it had no place in grade two. That might seem severe, but she was sincere. For when she was no more than seven, she'd had a great fright at a dizzying height in a building so tall it scraped heaven. On an architect's tour on the ninety-fifth floor, young Leela got lost from the group. She was found two days later. In a stuck elevator, eating cheese with a French circus troupe. After that day, it's quite safe to say, she thought all building lovers were nuts. As a teacher, she taught that above all, one ought to avoid them. No ifs, ands, or buts. As you might guess, it would cause Iggy stress to hear such terrible talk. But he didn't hear. He sat in the rear, while building a castle of chalk. You, Iggy Peck, your desk is a wreck. Tear down that castle right now. You will not build in here. Is that perfectly clear? Do you need to see Principal How? No, ma'am. Iggy said. He lowered his head, and his heart sank down to the floor. With no chance to build, his interest was killed. Now grade, now second grade was a bore. After twelve long days that passed in a haze of reading, writing, and arithmetic, Miss Greer took the class to Blue River Pass for a hike and an old-fashioned picnic. They crossed an old trestle. To a small island nestled in the heart of a burbling stream, but they no sooner passed than the footbridge collapsed, and Miss Leela Greer started to scream. "We're trapped here! Oh my! Alas, kids, goodbye!" Her eyeballs rolled back in her head. She dropped to the ground with a vague groaning sound. Luckily, fainted, not dead. The class was amazed. They stood there quite dazed, uncertain of what they should do. But one bright young man was off hatching a plan, which started with Miss Leela's shoe. Soon, each lad and lass there at Blue River Pass was working together as one. And when she came to. Miss Leela Greer knew that something quite brave had been done. She looked in the air and saw hanging there a structure with cables and braces, and on the far side, beaming with pride, were seventeen smiling young faces. Boots, tree roots, and strings, fruit roll-ups, and things, some of which one should not mention. Were stretched ridge to ridge in a glorious bridge, dangling from shoestring suspension. It all became clear to Miss Leela Greer as she crossed that bridge over the stream. There are worse things to do when you're in grade two than to spend your time building a dream. Now every week at Blue River Creek. Elementary in second grade. All the school kids can hear, along with Miss Greer, how the world's greatest buildings were made. The weekly guest speaker, in t-shirt and sneakers, talks of buildings from Rome to Quebec. Of course, he's the guy who builds towers from pie. That brilliant young man, Iggy Peck. Little Excavator 
by Anna Dudney. Here comes the big rigs, rolling down the street. Thumpa thumpa bumpa bumpa. Beep beep beep. Can you see little E ready on the spot? He's the little excavator working on the lot. Wham! goes the dozer, knocking down the walls. Rumble, rumble, crumble, crumble, fall, fall, fall. Little E is busy. He goes bam, bam, bam. Uh-oh! Little excavator, now you're in a jam. Grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Repeat the Cat Construction Destruction by James Dean. Recess! Pete shouts as the bell rings. But when Pete goes outside to play, oh no! The playground is a disaster! The swings are broken, the slide is rusty, and the sandbox is full of weeds. Pete makes plans for a new playground. Wow, says Principal Nancy. Can you really build that? Not by myself, says Pete. I'm going to need some help. Whatever you need, Pete, it's yours. The next day, Pete arrives at the playground before school. The construction crew is already there. He gives them the go-ahead to tear down the old playground. Creak! Crash! Down goes the slide. Clink! Clink! Down goes the swing. Bang! Boom! Down goes the tower. Honk! Honk! A truck arrives to recycle the metal. Rumble! Rumble! Honk! Honk! The new playground equipment has arrived. It's time to get to work. The cement mixer will pour concrete. The dump truck will bring sand and dirt. The backhoe will dig. The whole team will get the job done. Clunk! Whack! Thud! Building a playground is hard work. The new playground is cool, but it's not cool enough. What do you think? Pete asks, holding up his latest plans. It will be too hard to build, says one of the workers. And everything is almost finished, says another. But it will make this the best playground ever, Pete says. Then let's do it, the workers say. Screwdrivers twist in screws. Wrenches tighten the nuts. The workers try to make everything perfect. Hooray! The new playground is ready! Everyone is amazed until... Creak! 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 Smash! Crunch! Thud! Oh no! says Principal Nancy as the new playground crashes to the ground. The pieces are all mixed up! Everyone is disappointed, except for Pete. It's not how we planned it, Pete shouts. It's even better. This playground is filled with surprises and places to explore. The school playground is the most amazing playground ever. Sometimes, you've got to dare to dream big. The Construction Crew by Lynn Meltzer this old building's ready to fall. What do we need? Wrecking ball. Dig now, build later. What do we need? Excavator. Piles of earth, push them over. What do we need? Bulldozer. Move that boulder, away we go. What do we need? Backhoe! Tons of dirt and lots of muck. What do we need? Dump truck! Pour the foundation. That'll fix her. What do we need? Cement mixer! Pound that nail, drive that screw. What do we need? Construction crew! Making holes sure takes skill. What do we need? Power drill! The roof is high. Let's get there quicker. What do we need? Cherry picker! We'll use our hands. If all else fails, what do we need? Hammer and nails. 
Make it flat, says a stroller. What do we need? Steamroller. Time to paint. Watch the splatter. What do we need? Extension ladder. New home. Good luck. What do we need? Moving truck. New friends swapping favors. What do we need? Cheerful neighbors. On the wall, let's hang a poem. What does it say? Home sweet home.